Okay. Once again, everyone, thank you for attending. This is John Kokolakis, president of AHEPA Hermes Chapter 186. And we have a wonderful event here this evening, 1821, the liberation of Greece, liberty or death, presented by Vasilios Chrysokos. Vasilios Billy Chrysokos is a historical consultant who has given presentations on various Hellenic themed subjects, such as the historical significance of Orchidae, Byzantium's Macedonian dynasty, Byzantium for beginners, Cleopatra, the seventh visionary queen of Alexander the Great's Hellenic age, 1821, the liberation of Greece, and Alexander the Great, philosopher, king, hero, and legend, among many others. He's the primary composer, historical consultant, and producer of Porfira and the musical Anna and Vladimir, which debuted at Carnegie Hall and Off-Broadway. Set in the year 988 AD, the story chronicles Princess Anna Porfirianita and her marriage to Grand Prince Vladimir of the Kievan Rus. Vasilios also runs the Hellenic History Series channel across YouTube, Facebook, and Patreon. The channel begun as a tool to educate. It features original programs such as the Quest for the Prometheus, which searches for truth in history and modern politics, Greek cooking, and Porfira's music shows. Now, the channel is becoming the online video archive for rare and forgotten gems of Greek-inspired films, animated shows, concerts, and documentaries. Shows for our young viewers and the entire family. Our motto, look to the past to unlock the future. Vasilis Krishohos is the AHEPA District 6 Director of Culture and Arts for all of New York, past Director of Hellenism. He's also the AHEPA Hermes Chapter 186 Astoria Vice President, past Secretary. He's the UNESCO Piraeus New York Director of Modern Music, an awarded music video editor and member of ASCAP. He founded the Greek Artists Guild, the Hellenic American Center of the Arts, and the Alexander the Great Living History Society. With his wife, Despina, they founded the Porfira Foundation, which aims to promote cross-cultural education through compassionate and inspirational works. He's also a realtor with Metropolis Realty. He has a BA in political science, history, and a minor in education from Queens College. Mr. Chrysokos, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Brother John Kokolakis, from the uh, Astoria Hermes uh, 186 chapter of AHEPA. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and tuning in. And uh, let's start right away. This is 1821, the liberation of Greece, liberty or death. Uh, it was the motto of the Greek independence war. And now we are celebrating our 200-year anniversary of uh, since uh, Greece won its independence. Yes, hi. What is this? This is a lecture that daddy is giving, all right? What is this? What is this? Wait. <laughs> Το αύριο είμαι ίσως, εκείνο που συλλογέμενε το χτες. Το χτες γράφεται στο λογαριασμό σου και δεν αλλάζει. Έχετε καρδιά, έχετε πίστη, αλλιώς... Καθίστε εκεί που κάθεστε. Ραγιάδες όλα σας τα χρόνια. Πώς θα εγκανώσουμε 25.000 στρατό. Όλοι οι Έλληνες λαχτερούν τη λευτεριά τους. Και οι σουλιώτες, οι μανιάτες, και οι κλέπτες στα βουνά, και οι κυνηγημένοι που είναι στα εφτάνησα. Μην θα σας είναι κάτι κουμάντο. Δεν θα υποδείξεις εσύ τι θα γίνει. Να ξεκινήσουμε. Αυτό μετράει πάνω απ' όλα. Κι όταν ξεκινήσουμε, θα μας ακολουθήσουν χιλιάδες άλλοι! Ο Αρχιμανδρίτης ομίλησε ως αληθινός Απόστολος. Θα τον αποστήρουμε λοιπόν στην Πελοπόννησο, ως εκπρόσωπον της αρχής.
Γρηγόρη ως δικαίος, μα τον φωνάζουν οι Παπαφλέσσα. Κεφάλι που δεν προσκύνα πέφτει. All right, so that's a clip. That's a clip from a famous film, Papaflesas, about the Greek uh, Revolution. All right, so there are many, uh, many films that are made on the Greek uh, War of Independence, and uh, we do have some of them uh, on the Hellenic History series on YouTube. You can see them, and we are also in talks of licensing some of the other ones, like Papaflesas, to be able to show and uh, and screen. Uh, there were there's there's over ten. This is the most famous one. Is Bubulina. Uh, no, no, no. Escape from Galogu, uh, there's a few other ones, uh, Mandoma Pongenus, and so forth. So, um, after 400 years of struggle, of oppression from the Ottoman Turkish Empire, uh, we come to the emergence of the modern Hellenic state. So, what we're going to see is why it was important for these people to uh, gain independence, uh, their, how did they retain their national conscience, and uh, how their religion helped them also survive as well. And, uh, and the other Balkan peoples. Um, here you see Yorgos Karaiskakis, a famous painting by Yanis Niku. Dimitris Papamichael, that's right, he was a star of Papa Plesas. So usually what I, I like to do with uh, these presentations is we have a timeline of Greek history and we mention why we study Greek history. And some of the reasons are very obvious, like democracy, philosophy, Science, math, architecture. These are these are the people that that invented or perfected these uh, these techniques that we use to this day that made civilization possible. Theater, astronomy, uh, the need to have mythology to learn, art, engineering, of course, Christianity, uh, Greco-Roman law, biology, medicine, and so many other things. So the timeline: uh, Greece goes back a long, long way from 9,000 BC. That's uh, prehistoric Greece all the way to 500 BC. This is the uh, old ancient, ancient history, uh, Pelasgi and Cycladic, Minoan, Helladic, Mycenaean, and the Archaic Ages. Then we come to classical Greece of uh, the age of Pericles and the golden age of Athens. That's between 500 BC to 336 BC. Uh, then we come to Alexander the Great's Hellenistic age between 356 BC to 10 AD. Then Roman Greece, Byzantine Greece, which lasts for 1100 years from 330 AD till 1461, and then in 1453 comes the Ottoman occupation of Greece and the 400 years of slavery. So between 1453 and 1821, Greece is uh, occupied uh, by the Ottoman Turks. Uh, they're enslaved. Uh, there's 400 years of oppression. Uh, women are sold into harems, into slavery. The, the, the children, the firstborns, are, are sent into this uh, uh, very cruel uh, system called the Janissary system, where the firstborn Christian sons, males, are converted into uh, fanatic uh, Ottoman Muslims that have become the ultimate bodyguards of the Sultan, which in return uh basically are the people the janissaries that kill their own their own families afterwards they're the ones that are going to face and uh, and many other atrocities that are commit committed so there's about 124 revolutions since 1453 until we come to 1832 um when greece becomes independent i'm sorry 1821 1832 the the hellenic state uh, forms so we are now going to discuss the period of 1821 to 1832. And as you can see, I, I used uh, stamps from the Greek government uh, to showcase Greek history. We have some Minoan stamps, the Acropolis, Alexander the Great, uh, the Panagia, and, and maybe Jesus, uh, and uh, Lord Byron for the stamp. He was a famous Philhellene, which we'll uh, discuss some of the Philhellenes that helped uh, the, the movement for independence in a second. So some of our uh, global civilizations, which are very important uh, to discuss, because this is the reason we, we need to study the Greek Revolution. It's not just a revolution that was in Greece. It's a revolution that is a world revolution against tyranny, against uh, the old empires, the old system 
And uh, the Greeks helped usher in the, the modern age again with the Serbs and other peoples of the Balkans uh, when they won their independence. So some of the contributions to global civilization are democracy, right? The alphabet, the library, these con the, con the Olympics, science and mathematics. We, we talked about before trial by jury, standardized medicine. These are, these are the things that were contributed to civilization. Uh, then we have Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament translation uh, in Greek, Greek New Testament, Byzantine law, Greco-Roman law, the Alexander Romance, uh, influence of Western European thinking and philosophy. So Hellenism is a reactionary force always breaking the status quo through history. You know, they're always rebelling and, and trying to strive for something better. These are the things that, you know, they're, they're important that we need to, to learn why Hellenic civilization needs to be taught in academia to this day and why the Greek revolution helped rejuvenate these people again and liberate them. Uh, this presentation works best in a live environment uh, with a big projector, but you know, I'll try to explain to you some of the visual aids that we have. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the history of Greece through the modern drachma, the paper currency of modern Greece, some of the coins, some of the stamps. You see some folklore. You see some characters uh, in, in uh, some figures in the paper money, like Alexander the Great in the top center, Constantine the Great, Theodor Kolokotronis, Bubulina, Vigas Ferreos, the, the Greek revolutionaries were very important in the formation of the modern Greek state. You have mythology like Zeus, Athena. Uh, you have the Hom Homer, the, the great poet of the, of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And then you have other figures as well. This is what when the Greek modern Greek state uh, restarted its, its currency, they took a lot of the, the historical and mythological figures to inspire. And they were like actually little pieces of art, great pieces of art that were in the current, uh, in the paper money and the coins. Jogos Kaiskaki. I have a couple of old ones in the top left is Cleopatra, uh, which is not making it in the modern Greek coins and Basil the, the second the Bulgar Slayer in the um, other side of the ancient coins. But we have Alexander the Great, and we have Karaiskakis and so forth. So when I, when, whatever I'm going to show you is basically through the eyes of Greece, the government, the drachma, and, and the art. Um, so this is why we, we study why, why is Hellenic history still relevant today. The ages of Alexander the Great and St. Constantine the Great brought Western civilization uh, and its core values to the world. Um, this coin to the... To the right or your left, the gold coin is a solidus. It depicts Constantine the Great and Alexander the Great, and it's a gold coin of the fourth century. And this shows the two figures, how they symbolize the unbroken continuation of the Greco-Roman world. This is what's very important in our story about 1821. These people didn't come out of nowhere. They came out of ancient Greece and then Byzantine Greece through the Ottoman occupation into our modern world and, uh, and to liberate themselves. They had a long tradition, a long history, which they never forgot. And Constantine the Great and Alexander the Great are the two pieces of this puzzle. <laughs> These are the two empires. This is why Greeks are also, and people admire Greece, and, uh, and the Greeks were adamant about recreating a new Byzantium uh, in the age of nationalism in the 1800s. Alexander the Great's Hellenistic Age spans from 336 BC to 10 AD. That was for Greece's first global empire. You can see the map a little bit on the on the, my, my left side. Uh, that was a Greek universal empire with Hellenism binding together the various races. Alexander the Great's empire was from Greece and the Balkans all the way into India, uh, what is now modern day Pakistan and Bangladesh all the way from down North Africa, from Egypt, all the way to the Caucasus, where the Ukraine and Russia is. Uh, and many people, he built over 77 cities and his uh, uh, Yadohi, the successors, built cities and civilization and fused it. That was the synergy that Alexander the Great created with the native populations. And that's where we come from, all of us, from Judaism, from Buddhism, uh, Persian uh, ideas, Egyptian, they fused with Hellenism, and it, that's called Helen, uh, the Hellenistic Age. And those are the traditions that founded the, uh, the modern eras uh, and the cities that uh, he built and his successors. The Cleopatra was the last one. I have a lecture on Cleopatra. I have a lecture on Alexander the Great. You can see on Hellenic History Series and on Patreon. I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, to the right side, 
uh, we see the Byzantine Empire, that's the Greek medieval empire of Constantine the Great, which lasts 1100 years. And this is circa 565 AD, Justinian's uh, empire. That's the largest expansion of the Constantinople Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. And that's Greece's second global empire from 330 AD until 1461 AD. And that's a Greek Christian multicultural empire. This is what's very important. Um, and I've done a few of these lectures with uh, different church communities and, and, uh, and, other, and, and other HEPA chapters. And that's what we need to understand, that that was a Greek Christian multicultural empire, not the other way around. The nucleus was the Greeks. And then other people were involved, just like in every empire. There were Slavs, there were Armenians, there were Ethiopians, there were Russians, uh, Venetians, Italians, you name it. Uh, just like in the German empire, there were people that were not German. In the Russian Empire, you know, Catherine the Great was Bavarian. She was a German. The same thing with the Bulgarians. Same thing with the, the French. Same thing with, with, with the Byzantine Empire. It was a Greek multicultural empire. Um, these are the two empires that, that continue the Hellenic tradition. And uh, the Pythia knowledge from the ancient world to the medieval world with Christianity now. And they helped form the basis of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, up until 1453, uh, that's why I'm doing a very brief synopsis of the ancient history, just to get you up to speed why we, where we are in 1821. Uh, why was there a Greek War of Independence? Because after 1100 years of the Byzantine Empire, uh, for you purists, that, that is the Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantium, and uh, eventually falls. After 1100 years, every empire falls, even our own did. Uh, and in 1453, it was a very tiny fragment of what it was around the city of Constantinople, the Moria, which is the Peloponnese, and, and tra the Empire of Trabizon, the Despotate of Epirus, and some other uh, islands. Um, so before the beginning of the siege, Mehmed II, uh, that, that is the Ottoman Sultan, made an offer to Constantine the 11th, Palaiologos, the last emperor of Byzantium. Uh, in exchange for the surrender of Constantinople, the emperor's life would be spared and he would continue to rule in Mistra, in the Peloponnese. As preserved by the historian George Francis, Constantine replied, to surrender the city to you is beyond my authority or anyone else's who lives in it. For all of us, after taking the mutual decision, shall die of our own free will without trying to save our lives. So Constantine Palaiologos, uh, knew that he was going to die. He was going to die defending his city and the empire because it was inevitable. Uh, they still, there still was hope that there would be another crusade to liberate and protect Constantinople from the West. And uh, we go into this to our show the question of Prometheus. So in um, the question for Prometheus, our other show on, on Patreon, uh, Hellenic History Series, we have done the Battle of Varna, which was a the last Christian crusade of the Balkans uh, instigated by Pope Pius II, um, I believe, in 1444. And then there's one in 1459 that's called the Crusade Focus of Inopo, the Vlad the Impaler of Romania, Vlad the Dracula. He takes to liberate Constantinople. And I was also inspired by Anna Notaras, who I will briefly mention in a little bit. She was a, a princess of the... Um, Constantinople, the, the last dynasty, the imperial dynasty, and she went to Venice with other Greeks to help uh, to escape from the Turks with the blessing of the Logos and to restart the Renaissance in Western Europe. But uh, that's that's in our video in the Quest for Prometheus about the Battle of Varna. You can learn more about the event, the 10 year events prior to Constantinople. Now we have the Ottoman Turkish Empire that comes next into the uh, as, as a player in this part of the world. They, they take over Greece, the Byzantine Empire. And as you can see in this map, they basically take over most of Eastern Europe, uh, good chunks of North Africa, Egypt, Anatolia, which was a heartland of, Asia, uh, of, of, of Greece back then, Armenia, Syria, chunks of Arabia, Armenia, and so forth. So it's a very big power. The Ottoman Turkish Empire spans between 1280 and 1922, uh, approximately um, about 600, 550 years or so. Uh, and that's the, 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 the highest part of the empire right here in this map. Uh, the extent was in the late uh, 1500s. 
some key Ottoman uh, figures. We have Osman I, who is the founding uh, father of the Ottoman uh, dynasty in the year 1280, that is, uh, as, as legend has it. Uh, then the next big uh, Ottoman sultan is Mehmed II, the conqueror, who captured Constantinople in 1453. Then comes uh, another great uh, to the Ottoman um, sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, Suleiman. Uh, who, who brings the uh, the empire to its height in 1566? So about uh, it took about a hundred years, and uh, the the Turks were knocking on the gates of Vienna basically. Uh, they had conquered all the Balkans, North Africa, and they were basically on their way to Central Europe. Uh, then in our story right now we have Mahmoud II, whose reign centers around the bulk of the Greek Revolution between 1820 to 1829. He is the Sultan of uh, of our era in the Greek Revolution. And um, he is one that uh, actually um, gets rid of the Janissary system because by now, as a, uh, let me just mention, the Janissaries were as a, uh, an elite unit that becomes the bodyguards of the sultans that starts uh, in the 30, late 1300s, like about 100 years after the institution of the Ottoman Empire begins. The Turks have the idea that they, if they take the natives and they convert them, uh, they will make them into uh, ultimate warriors because they, they were very good warriors to begin with, the native population. So they took the firstborn uh, male children of every family. That was the tax. And they will convert them. They will take them away from their families. They will convert them into uh, warriors. They will know nothing else but to fight and kill. And they be become the ultimate bodyguards of the, the sultan. And uh, they lived on their own. They didn't really mix with other Turks. And... They were more vicious than the Turks, and they would do more damage to the Christians uh, than even the, the actual Turks for a certain extent of time. And then they eventually became very powerful, the Janissaries, who by the time of uh, the 1800s, they were actually starting rebelling against the Sultan himself. And one of them was an Albanian uh, uh, pasha called uh, Ali Pasha, uh, north of Epidos in what is now modern Albania. Back then it was Epidos and other, you know, native lands there and uh he had almost be, be made his own kingdom with the beginning he, he told the the pirotes the Shuyotes, that uh, he will lie with them and then uh he wanted to overthrow the sultan uh so the sultan in Constantinople got wind of that uh and they got rid of the janissary system but until uh for a good 200 years uh it's historians uh, have said that we've lost over a, a million souls the Greeks have lost over a million souls that became Turks and fanatic Turks and other Balkan people like uh, Romanian, Serbs, uh, Russians, you know, Italian people that were from the, from the vicinity, they were all converted. Uh, aside from the women that were sold into the harem slavery in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and, and, uh, and other kids that would not be born. That is the ultimate loss, the genitory system, which is a crime against humanity which we need to understand that happened to our people and all the uh, Balkan Christian people. Um, so let's go to the next one. So from the uh, fall of Constantinople, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a lot of notable uh, Greeks uh, were fleeing to the West. Uh, it's not like it happened in 1453. It happened from 100 years prior. They got... Uh, you know, the people there knew what was coming and they slowly started going into other communities, into the Russian Empire, uh, into Venice and from Venice into France and other areas. And uh, many notables were, um, uh, like, as I mentioned, Anna Notaras is the daughter of Lucas Notaras, the Grand Duke of the Byzantine Empire, who was encouraged by Constantine XI to escape the Pope of Constantinople and settle in Venice and bring her a lot of the books, the, 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 the knowledge of the library of Constantinople. She's the one that brought the books over uh, with scholars. And it took her about 10 years to establish a Greek community there. And then um, I believe the, the Cathedral of St. George and then the Greek church, because the, the Catholics didn't want that in the beginning. Uh, but she was instrumental in establishing a Greek diaspora in Venice. That's one of our oldest uh, diasporas. And uh, about 10 years prior to the Gutenberg uh, printing machine, then they were able to print um, eventually uh, a lot of uh, books. She, she was a little bit before that, but she brought that knowledge that they were actually able to reprint the classics and rediscover them. And that spurs on the Renaissance. That is, that is very important. Um, so 
So uh, a little bit more about her. She finds a center for Hellenic studies and Greek civilization, which uh, becomes the Greek community of Venice, as I mentioned. And uh, oh, in the Gutenberg Press, I already mentioned that. Uh, Manuel Chrysoloros is a Byzantine scholar that was invited to lecture at the University of Florence. He's another notable uh, academic uh, from that time period. Dimitrios Halkoconvilis, Gian Argyropoulos, Constantine Lascaris. They all fled in um, Constantinople and found refuge in the Latin West, bringing with them knowledge and documents from the Greco Roman tradition to Italy. Um, Cardinal Bessarion, he's a in between 1395 and 1472 of Trebizond, Pondos was a Greek scholar, statesman and cardinal and one of the leading figures in the rise of the intellectual renaissance. Uh, Google him, Cardinal Bessarion. He's another important figure. And of course, as the picture you see right there, that is of uh, El Greco, uh, the Greek, whose nickname was Dominico Sotokopoulos, and he was a Cretan painter and one of the last of the Byzantine tradition. So he went to Spain. Uh, other Greeks also went to Spain. Over here, we have to our left a portrait of Alexander the Great, uh, portrait of Alexander Lagrand, political pamphlet of Rigas Ferreos, one of the early uh, precursors to the Greek Revolution. He's the one that actually began the movement for the Greek Revolution, Rigas Ferreos Velestinis. Uh, and I have uh, extensive lectures and, and we have videos about Alexander the Great and about the Macedonian struggle the history of the role of Macedonia throughout Greek and world history in the quest for Prometheus on patreon.com and also on the Hellenic history series on Facebook. You can find them on um, Patreon and on YouTube. Hellenic history series. You can see these shows that we talk more about these, uh, these issues. On the top is the two prophets of the revolution, Adamantios Korais and Rigas Ferreos, who are raising the suffering made in Greece to her feet. Uh, you can see that picture. These are the proto-revolutionaries. Uh, and uh, the French and American revolutions, which only predate by about 30 years the Greek Revolution, influenced Greeks to rise up against tyranny. A lot of ideas of the Greeks that went to the West and, and to Russia, they actually influenced also uh, the French and the American revolutions to a certain extent. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a synergy, but it goes back and forth. But definitely after the American and the French revolutions, uh, Greece is the one that, that, that is inspired to rise up and they see, they see the time is, is right. Uh, although that's not very, very true uh, realistically, which we'll discuss in a second. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, had correspondence with uh, Rigas Ferreos and, um, and, the, and the early proto-revolutionary heroes. Um, and Ahepa has done a lot of, uh, with uh, alternate government, uh, Governor Lukacos on MCA. I've done a lot of lectures on all these topics for the Greek Revolution all year long. You can find it on HEPA.org or MCA.com. Um, so, as I said, uh, the, it was time to have a uh, rise for independence after the French and the American revolutions. Uh, the Greeks and the Serbians began their independence. The Serbians got autonomy first uh, in the early 1800s, and uh, Greece only got it in 1821. But that was the age of Metternich. So there was the status quo. What does that mean? Uh, the status quo was a term that was basically kind of coined by a Prince Metternich of, uh, of Austria that wanted to maintain the balance of power uh, with the monarchies, with, with the powers of the time, uh, which were, um, uh, they wanted to resist the nationalistic movements and independence movements. They wanted to keep things as they were after the French Revolution. So uh, they didn't want things to happen in Russia, in Central Europe, and lands belonging to the Ottoman Empire. They wanted to keep things as they were, even though the Ottoman Empire was declining and crumbling and the people wanted to liberate themselves and the people from the Austria-Hungarian Empire wanted to get rid of the shackles of, uh, of oppression and create their own nation states, allow the Slavic people uh, with the Serbs. Uh, and the Croatians, they, the Prince Metternich wanted to keep things as it was. And that is called the status quo. And um, before the Congress of Vienna, uh, after they defeat uh, Napoleon in 1812 um, and Europe in 1815, you can see the map a little bit. Uh, you have France, you have Spain, you have uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, Great Britain, 
Uh, Italy's sort of uh, forming, but not yet. But those are the main, the main empire, uh, the main uh, uh, empires, and then uh, and then Germany eventually becomes from after Greek wins, uh, Greece wins independence becomes uh, in 1848, I believe, uh, a country uh, as well. So Germany was a bunch of uh, different federations and sort of city states. But the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was a satellite empire, uh, was very big, and so was France and Spain, uh, England, Ottoman Empire, and Russia. So th those were the powers of the time. Uh, and this is the world that the, the Greeks wanted to break away and, uh, and, and, and have their own nation state. And actually, the, the idea was to recreate a new Byzantium. And um, I'm reading some of the comments. And... Uh, a new Byzantium for a new era that uh, that had some basis in uh, humanism of, of the, from the French Revolution and, uh, and the traditional uh, Orthodox Christianity and, and the, the culture and history that was behind it. Uh, they wanted to recapture Constantinople and take uh, the Ottoman Empire from within, because uh, as I will show you, um, why did they did they care so much? As we mentioned, the Greeks had a long tradition, a long history, a long memory. Uh, with other people of, of the Balkans. And from Homeric, in this map, you see a comparison of regions in ancient the revolution era Greece. From Homeric times, around 1200 you know, BC, the time of the Achaeans and the Trojans and the Trojan War, the city-states and all those places, people in 1821 had the same thing. They had their flags, the Lavara, and every place in Greece, they, they knew who they were. They, even if they were not united, they would make uh, revolts. And they will aspire to unite, to make another Greece. So they never forgot who they were from the ancient times. Uh, and one of the leading uh, uh, generals of uh, the revolution, Theodore Kolokotronis, here you see a stamp on the top left of him from, the, uh, from Greece and uh, money from the bottom of, of the era. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Kolokotronis' memoirs. Uh, and he says, according to my judgment, the French Revolution and the doings of Napoleon opened the eyes of the world. The nations knew nothing before, and the people thought that kings were gods upon the earth, and that they were bound to say that whatever they did as well done. Uh, his other quote is, Greeks, God has signed our liberty and will not go back on his promise. This was quoted in Statis Paraskevopoulos' uh, History of Kokotronis book. So God played a very... Uh, important uh, was a very important tool you know Christianity the homeland the family in the Greek revolution and uh, that's evident by their memoirs and their sayings of the, of the Greek heroes so who are the key players of the of the Greek war of independence so this is what I was saying is better to see this live and hopefully I can do this live some you know for your uh, location some other time but um there's a painting of Theodore Rizakis in the top left. It uh, hangs in the Benaki Museum. That's of uh, Paleon Patron Germanos, the bishop that raises the flag of the revolution in the Ia Lavra. That's in Calavita, which I'm proud to say is where my mother comes from. <laughs> uh, on March 25th, 1821, that is the, the date uh, that becomes the established date of the Greek War of Independence. And um, the revolution begins... It takes 11 years, four months, two weeks, and one day, starting from March 6th, 1821, until July 21, 1832. Uh, the location is the Balkans, mainly Greece and the Aegean Sea. And the result is Greek victory and establishment of the Kingdom of Greece with the Treaty of Constantinople. So who are the, the, the key players? Is uh, the Greek revolutionaries uh, that forms the first Hellenic Republic right away in 1821. Um, we have the Russian Empire, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and the Kingdom of France. Those are the allies of, of the Greeks. And the belligerents uh, who they're revolting against and they're fighting is the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Eyalet of Egypt, uh, and a few other, uh, the Bialik of Tunis and the Regency of Algiers, North African uh, uh, Muslim kingdoms. So... Those are the main uh, empires that are fighting. So you can see eventually in our story, the, the, the great powers do join in to a certain extent to, to help Greece liberate itself. Some uh, key commanders and leaders from the Greeks is Alexander Epsilantis, Theodor Kolokotronis, um, Lascarina Bubulina, 
Yogos Karaiskakis, Constantin Canaris, uh, Andreas Vianoulis. Uh, some of the key Turks Ottomans are Sultan Mahmoud II, Mohammed Ali Pasha, Omer Vrioni, Mahmoud Ramali Pasha, uh, Husid Pasha, and Ibrahim Pasha, who is the, actually another Albanian. He is the Sultan of Egypt, who, who under the calling of Mahmoud goes to invade the Peloponnese. And that actually causes the great powers to intervene on the behalf of Greece to stop the Arabs and the Turks from basically changing the ethnic structure of, of the Peloponnese in Greece and uh, erasing the Greeks. You know, that's how that's what forced them to eventually come into the aid of Greece. And there's a movement that comes that's called uh, Philhellenism, that uh, peoples from uh, England, from America, from France, Germany, they went to fight for Greece. They went to raise money for Greece, for the Greek of independence and for the other Christians. Um, they were witnessing genocides that were happening, like in Chios, uh, the island after the, they rebelled, they were slaughtered and retaliation from the Sultan. Uh, all the women were sold into slavery. The men were, were basically slaughtered. That's a, it's, a, it's called the massacre of Chios that caused the Western powers to eventually intervene. Um, and uh, there is um, that movement. There's a lot of Greeks that with the uh, Russian and Turkish wars, they fought Russia for 12 wars with Turkey, uh, both land and naval battles in a period of over 300 years from the 1600s up until 1900. And uh, a few of those battles were the ones that actually helped uh, turn the tide uh, for the Greeks and the Serbs and Romanians and the Bulgarians. That's the Russia, Russia, Russian Turkish wars. And um, let's uh, read out a little bit more about some of the other important Greek figures. So we mentioned Vigas Fereos, Adamandios Korais, and many others that were inspired by the French Revolution. Uh, Alexander Ypsilantis, who was a member of the prominent Fanayot Greek family. He was a prince of the Danubian uh, principalities. Uh, a senior officer of the Imperial Russian Cavalry during the Napoleonic Wars and a leader of the Filiketeria, a secret organization that coordinated the beginning of the Greek War of Independence against the Ottoman Empire. We have uh, Theodore Kolokotronis, who was a Greek general and the preeminent leader of the Greek War of Independence against the Ottoman Empire. Kolokotronis' greatest success was the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, uh, army under Mahmoud Ramali Pasha, the Battle of Dervenakia in 1822. In 1825, he was appointed commander-in-chief of the Greek forces in the Peloponnese. And Lascarina Bubulina Pinotsis was a Greek naval commander, heroine of the Greek War of Independence in 1821, and first woman admiral of the Imperial Russian Navy. After her death, Emperor Alexander I of Russia granted Bubulina the honorary rank of admiral of the Russian Navy, making her, until recently, the only woman in, in the world, uh, naval history, to hold this title. Uh, and there's also Mandoma Vrogenus, she was another famous Greek revolutionary from uh, Mykonos, um, who actually, her family comes, they were Fanayotes from Moldavia and um, Wallachia, where the Greek War of Independence uh, will begin. I don't want to give that clue, but these are some of the important Greek figures. Uh, there was a secret organization. All right. First of all, there was a secret organization that uh, had sworn to defend Constantinople back in uh, 1453 and from the Battle of Kosovo in 1389 called the Order of the Dragon of St. George. Uh, I, I talk about that with uh, the quest for Prometheus in the Battle of Varna. But now it's very, very important as well, the Order of the Dragon. Uh, but now in 1821, the Filiquiteria or the Society of Friends, uh, was a secret organization founded in 1814 in Odessa, whose purpose was to overthrow the Ottoman rule of Greece and establish an independent Greek state. Society members were mainly young Fanayot Greeks from Constantinople and the Russian Empire and other regions of Greece and the Balkan states. So, Filikiteria is found in Odessa, which is now in uh, Russia or the Ukrainian region in the Black Sea, which is a, a very big Greek community to this day. And uh, the Fanayotes um, were the uh, wealthy uh, merchants and aristocrats during the Ottoman Empire that come from the 
area, they're, na they're named after the area of Fanari, <clears throat> Fanari in Constantinople, uh, which I have visited. It's uh, near the Patriarchate of Constantinople. And um, they ruled uh, what is now modern day Romania for over 100 years, uh, close to 200 years uh, prior from the 1700s, uh, the 1680s uh, up until uh, 1880s. Uh, the Fanayotes ruled Wallachia and Moldavia, which is very important. And uh, obviously, there were in other parts of Greece. They they held the trade of the Eastern Mediterranean. It was run by the Fanayotes, and they believed that eventually they will reestablish a Byzantine Empire through the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. That was uh, the primary belief of the Filiketeria and the Fanayotes. Other uh, Greeks uh, that were more under with the, uh, the Western sway, they believe they will restart a new nation state. Um, and other, um, there were other factions. You know, there's always different ideologies of how the new nation state will be, but this is the primary one. Here we have, uh, the center one is one of my old art pieces of Bubulina and Colocotroni. Uh, as I mentioned, Calavita is where the Greek revolution begins. But is it? Uh, there are many contenders. So we, had, we see Colocotroni in one side, Bubulina on her ship, the Agamemnon in another side. The revolution actually begins in Wallachia and Moldavia in the Danubian provinces, uh, now Romania. Uh, the land of Vlad Dracula, right? Vlad the Impaler. That's where the Fanariotes ruled for 200 years. Uh, it was supposed to be instant, to take instant, uh, place instantaneously in three places. All right, it almost occurred in Constantinople as well. And then it was supposed to take uh, in, the, in the Peloponnese, in the Moria. Uh, so the Moria, Constantinople, and Wallachia and Moldavia. That's how the Filikiteria had uh, structured and uh, planned for the Greek Revolution to begin. Uh, now it began, the Constantinople was very hard because that's, that's the, the seat of Ottoman Empire and the Sultan. So unfortunately, that kind of didn't fall. Uh, there were some revolutions that began, uprisings in Mani uh, and other places. Uh, but the main force was focused at, in uh, Wallachia and Moldavia. Uh, and they start fighting the Ottomans in August of 1821. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, there's different versions of, of history when, when nation states formed of, of what you read and what you learn and what things are taught. Uh, I... I've always infatuated with this, with this part of your history in the Fanayotes and the uprising in Wallachia. And uh, we, we find that a lot of our history does take place in this, in this area. And then we have a lot of, uh, like the vlogs and, and things, a lot of, a lot of commonalities. Uh, but as the um, Romanians were also trying to get their own step and, you know, make their own nation state, at first they, they, they sided with the Landis. Uh, and they wanted to recreate, the, the idea was very welcome, welcoming to recreate the Byzantine Empire. But then you had some others that wanted to create their own state, and they viewed the uh, Fanayotas as uh, the tools of the sultans. They collected the taxes and so forth. But their nation and the Balkans were basically um, raised by the churches that the Fanayotas built, uh, the school system that was taught the Greek language, and the Pavia, that's what actually helped them also uh, form their own nation states. But they, they didn't meet eye to eye eventually, and that revolt failed because it wasn't a solidly Greek land, although it had a sizable Greek minority and, uh, and the ruling elite that was Greek. Uh, so then it falls back to the Peloponnese in the Moria. That's where the revolution uh, then takes uh, uh, sparks fire. Now, mind you, Macedonia, Epidos, Thrace, that they would be liberated a lot later, about, uh, you know, in 1912. So Greece had a long way to grow, but the revolution begins in the, eventually in the Peloponnese after it starts in Moldavia and Wallachia. In this map, you see uh, how it split. There's Transylvania, Moldavia, Wallachia. Um, I won't go into the details of what was going on, but... Um, the map of, the, of Eastern Europe there gives you a better, a better look of how high up the, the Greek Revolution began. Because Romania is across from Odessa in the Black Sea because the Greeks that 
uh, started, lived there, and uh, they were trained in the Russian army and the Russian forces. Unfortunately, uh, the czars of Russia, because it was an empire, they had signed a, something called the, the Holy Alliance with Prussia and Austria uh, um, to keep the status quo prior to, to Metternich as well. And uh, it, was, it didn't suit them to openly proclaim uh, support for you know, Greek or Serbian revolutionaries to start uh, nation building. But they didn't like the Ottoman Empire because they, they were their arch enemies. And they did secretly support the Greeks and the Serbs uh, and the Bulgarians. So, and they were also Orthodox. So the Russians definitely helped train. And then the Philhellenes from the West also helped uh, bring in money uh, and guns and aid to, to Greece as well. That, that's what's called the Philhellenic movement. And there you see something very interesting, st stamps from Moldova of the Ypsilanti, fa uh, the Ypsilanti family and Mavroyanus family as well. Dimitrios Ypsilantis was the brother of Alexandros. Dimitrios uh, falls in love with Mandoma Vroyanus, and uh, they had a very torrid love affair, and they both loved their countries, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. But they were also from the families uh, that ruled, uh, the Fanayoti families that ruled Palakia. Uh, I will be probably doing a show about that in the future, and about a Greek art also, the, all the, the painters and the artists of the Greek Revolution. That, there's a lot. There's a lot. I can only do so much visual aids uh, in this one. I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, so in Epidos, that's in north uh, west Greece. Uh, the women from Suli, in order to avoid capture and enslavement from Ali Pasha's Ottoman Albanian troops, throw their children first and then themselves off a steep cliff committing suicide. That's immortalized in the famous Alogo dance. So what happened there is the... Uh, Ali Pasha, who was uh, an Albanian uh, chieftain, uh, wants to be assaulted. And he basically wants to do away with the Sultan of Sardinopol because at this time period, the Sultan was weak and he wasn't to be bothered with ruling an empire. Ali Pasha was like a Napoleon of, of you know, his era. and He was very uh, uh, ambitious. And he promised the Greeks of the area, the Epirotes, that if they unite with him against the Turks, He'll give him a, you know, a bigger piece of the pie. And then he lied and slaughtered them and, and the women to avoid their kids being sold into slavery and becoming, you know, Albanian uh, Muslims that will go back to the Turks again. They would rather die and, and kill the children as well. And that's what happened throughout Greece and many places, especially in Suli. Uh, Dimitrios Makris is a Greek cleft chief of the 19th century. And another one is a famous watercolor painting of an armatolos by Karl Hag. Uh, another German painter. Uh, some famous Armatoli are Athanasius Diakos, Yorgos Kraiskakis, Yorgakis Olympios, Krokodilos, Tladas, Odysseus Andruzos, and Yanis Stathas. Um, these are other revolutionary uh, forces and people, the Clefs and the Armatoli, who were from the, from the mountains. Um, they were different to the Fanariotes and different to the aristocrats that would. Uh, formed the foundation of the Greek elite. Uh, these dudes were the mountain men, you know, brigandiers, um, some were pirates, but they wanted to get rid of the Turks, but in their own terms. And they carried weapons, and usually the Turks did not even go to the mountains because they were afraid of them. So they taxed the people in the lowlands. That's what the Armatoli and the Cleptas were. Uh, in the left, we see a picture of George Canning, who was the architect of the Treaty of uh, London, which, uh, launched European intervention in the Greek conflict. In the right, we see Tsar Nicholas I, who co-signed the Treaty of London, and then launched the Russo-Turkish War of 1828-1829, which finally secured Greek independence. And that is very important. And I see um, some in the chat, they, they mentioned also Russia photo wars against the Turks, so forth. Um, all right, let's look at this time lapse of uh, the Greek Revolution, hopefully we can make it out.
so basically um the modern greek uh, nation was um the peloponnese what is uh in central greece uh, south of thessaly that was that was greece and some of the islands uh, that that was in 1832 um with the establishment of uh, of, the, of the first hellenic kingdom so first is the hellenic republic that forms almost right away and then the great powers uh of uh of Germany, Austria-Hungary, France, and England, uh, they didn't want to help Greece anymore. So this is what happens: is now they 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 put a Bavarian, a German uh, king, uh, to rule Greece. Uh, Otto and uh, his wife Amalia, who are actually very good for Greece, um, and they actually do support the Greek cause to expand, and they become patriots themselves, uh, as well as become Greek Orthodox. But this is the plan of the great powers was we can't stop the Greeks and the Serbs and the Bulgarians from, from getting uh, independence. But how much independence is what they were able to control? And they also didn't want to see the Ottoman Empire totally crumble because they didn't want to see the Russian Empire get those lands. Because uh, in the late 1870s, there's another war between the Russians and the Turks. And then they secede the Black Sea uh, to, to Russia. They lose. And then... Um, that forces the Russians to kind of uh, uh, stop a little bit fighting the Turks for a little while. There's another war prior to the revolution that actually, I'm sorry, the Black Sea becomes part of it prior to the revolution uh, in the 1780s, not the 1880s. And that actually stops for, for a period that the wars with, with, uh, with Turkey from the Russian Empire. But that also helps the Greeks migrate into the Black Sea now that it's free from the Ottomans and they're going to the, the Russian Empire. But... Um, to a certain extent, the British and the French did not want to see Russia take over uh, their parts uh, of the Ottomans that they saw fit that they wanted, the Ottoman Empire. And then France wanted parts of the Ottoman Empire. So did Germany and so did uh, England, because uh, at this time they were colonizing the world. North Africa, I mean, Africa, uh, India, the Middle East was being partitioned into French, English, German uh, territories and uh, the Caucasus republics were becoming Russian eventually, not yet. So they didn't want to see Russia expand. So they didn't want to help Greece too much. But they, they knew the inevitable was that they have to give them, uh, as they will do to all the other uh, Balkan nations, Germanic uh, kings. Now, what happens, Greece in chunks takes over more land, like Thessaly becomes part of, uh, of Greece much later. Um, by 1878... Let's see. Uh, the bulk of, of, of modern Greece becomes independent in 1912 in the Balkan Wars. So it takes almost 80 years to get everything back. And that, that's what founds the idea of the Megali Vea, the great idea to recreate Byzantium. We got, we got our, our first foot uh, forward. We have a small nation right now. And the Greeks envision that eventually they'll be able to take Asia Minor uh, and Northern Greece, Macedonia. Epirus, Thrace, and Thessaly, and the islands, because a lot of the islands were controlled by the Venetians, uh, the British, and uh, other powers. So Greece is very small, but they have ambitions, and the, and the war eventually will continue and continue and continue, because Crete is not even part of the modern Greek nation. And there are many uprisings in Crete, in Cyprus, and in various places of Anatolia and Asia Minor. So by 1832, the Greek kingdom is up to... Stereai Las, uh, mainland Greece. And um, the first king is a Bavarian German who actually is loved by Greeks to this day. Amalia actually designs the first costumes, we call the Amalia costumes. She, she kind of refined and modernized the classic traditional wear that the women wore of that time. And um, King Aro and Tsolia outfit that we know of them, they kind of like uh, modernized it. And they were very favorable to the, to the Greeks. Um, but unfortunately, they were part of a um, Germanic, uh, uh, British uh, dynasty. And because they were very pro-Greek, they actually were ousted by the great powers and they, and they were removed. And they used uh, as an incentive uh, Greek civil wars and, uh, and other uh, rebellions among the Greek elite um, to replace him with uh, with a Danish monarchy, so a, a different German monarchy that was very weak and more subservient, uh, subservient 
to the Germans other than uh, Otto and Amalia. Uh, and I, that becomes the, the next almost 160 uh, years of Greek history as a monarchy with, you know, different uh, uh, constitutional democracies and, and other systems of government. There's always going to be many, 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 many governments that will form. And modern Greece has a, a, a lot a lot of time and a lot of decades still to evolve in what we know. Uh, that is the 1821 liberation of Greece. Uh, on top, you see the, the formation of, you know, the, the embodiment of the Greek figure. And on the bottom, you see a picture of Eugene de la Croix, which is the massacre of Chios, a very famous painting that in, in 1822 that happened, that inspired the great powers to intervene in the Battle of Navarino many years later and to stop the Turks from farther killing uh, in a genocide with the Greeks and to help them and to defeat the Ottoman fleets. Uh, so there's a lot more. This is just a synopsis. Some of my works, uh, like if you can support, uh, I have a, a group called Porphyra. We did a rock opera in Carnegie Hall and off Broadway that uh, chronicles the story of Anna Porfiro Yenita and Vladimir the Great of the Kievan Rus and their love story that takes place in the time of Basil II of, Nine, of Byzantium. If you remember the Penelope Delta books, Vulgar Octonos. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this uh, we have the Hellenic History series on YouTube where you can find movies on the Greek Revolution, you know, cartoons in Greek and English, different versions that we've been archiving that are very old, uh, very good. Uh, silent era films, films that, that were banned on Zmini, on mythology, uh, you name it, we have it there, along with our original programming of the Quest for Prometheus that we search for the history of modern politics and history. So we have our original programs, and we have becoming an archival base for Greek-themed films and cartoons and documentaries in the Hellenic History Series on YouTube, Facebook, and on Patreon. Where if you guys can help for even a dollar a month, you can help us create a lot of new videos. And right now we're working on, on a World War One. The, the whole story between the, of Greece and Serbia from 1912 until 1922 with rare archival pictures and footage uh, with three-part documentary. That's what we're doing right now. That continues the story of the Greek revolution. Uh, that's in the patreon.com Hellenic history series. And that's it for now for me. <laughs> so now brother Pete and brother John, we can ask, you know, if anybody has any questions, we can answer them now. Sure. Thank you, Brother Chrysokos. That was wonderful, very informative. Uh, we definitely appreciate it and uh, refreshed our memory on certain things and uh, taught us a few other things. Uh, anyone have any questions? If you do, you're more than welcome to type them in the chat. And yeah. Brother Peter, if you like, you can read them and uh, yes. Brother Chrysokos will uh, answer them. Don't be shy. Any questions? You know, if we don't see questions, Brother Billy, it means you did that well of a job. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? I've got questions, but I'd prefer to speak the question rather than write That's it. Fine. Is that possible? Sure, That's sure, fine. of course. Sure. Um, it's John Banos in Australia. Um, I love the presentation. Very good. There seem to be, though, three points of view. There is a Greek point of view on that period. There appears to be an Ottoman point of view. And there appears to be a point of view from independent nations or allied nations, maybe the French, British, and so on. In the Peloponnese, if you read British literature, um, they claim that there was a lot of genocide there, that Muslims were about 40% of the population, and after the 1820s, they were pushed to zero. They write a lot about the massacres of Tripolita, where Kolokotronis was involved with basically genocide, killing women and children in the thousands, which was then followed by another massacre in here, which you, you've referred to. Um, the British say that the Battle of Navarino in 1827, when well, they that... destroyed the Battle of Navarino in 1827, when they destroyed 90% of the Ottoman fleet, mm -hmm. that did the major damage to the Ottomans. It wasn't the Kleftes and the Armatoli. 
Mm -hmm. Could you give us some of your perspectives on those perspectives? And they also claim that Kolokotronis was actually put in prison by the Greeks because of these massacres. Do you have any point uh, of view on, on that? Well, these are very good points, Mr. Banners. Uh, thank you so much for listening in from, from all the way from Australia. Thank you. Um, uh, well, listen, the Kolokotronis family, just to give you a perspective of how many died fighting the Ottoman Turks, 77 Kolokotroni died. His, his basically entire family died to liberate Greece. So yeah, there, there, were, there, were, there were atrocities that happened on both sides. That's, uh, it's, it's a war of independence. You know, a tiny nation that almost vanished had to survive. And yeah, they killed. There, there, there definitely were some massacres. But there is a there is a revisionist uh, activity that is happening on behalf of the, of the of the Turkish government now that they're basically rewriting history because you know we have the sources. I mean, you can find actual sources of the of the time period from the French, from Germans. Uh, I mean, so many so many artists and painters, you know, actually painted uh, portraits from the different uh, Peter von Hess, uh, uh, the, the other uh, Carl Hag. I mentioned there were like about five. Um, Eugene Delacroix, you know, these are, these are major figures. You had Lord Byron that went to fight for the Greek War of Independence. He was there, first-hand account. He was killed. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we, we have evidence of what happened. Uh, this is like modern revisionist history that they're calling the Greeks committed atroc atrocities. I mean, as a, that's, that's the point of this, of this presentation, is basically to show you from the beginning what happened. 1453 and earlier, the Greeks were basically we lost millions of, of people that became now Turks from the Janissary system, from the adoption of the women and the children that went to the harems. See, the, the Africans that went to, you know, the, the new world it, were able to find their families and create families, right? It still was slavery, it was harsh, and it was, you know, detrimental to them. But the Greeks and other Christians under the Ottoman caste system, they lost their identity. So you, you, once you became a Turk, that was it. You became actually a more fanatic Turk than they were, and you would go back and slaughter your families. That's that's the that's the that's a difference. And they had both male and female harems. This is another thing that's not talked about in history that much because they control the media. You know, they they, they were you know harems of men, boys, you know, pedoph pedophilia, uh, and and of young girls, and and of you know all, all over the Ottoman the Ottoman caste system. Um, the story of Vladimir Paler, why he hated the Turks so much, just to show you a little bit. He, he and his brother Murad the Handsome, you know, they were the Romanian uh, uh, princes from Wallachia. Uh, they were held as ransom uh, in the Ottoman court and they were raised with Mehmet. Right? They, they, they were, you know, basically uh, under his uh, auspices. And Radu became, he was... Mehmed forced himself on him, and he became his lover eventually. And uh, that's how he was able to convert him. And then he eventually took over the Romanian uh, uh, principalities. And, and when Vlad escaped, you know, he, he, he saw that side of the Turks. He learned how brutal they were, the impalements. He learned how they treated Christians. He learned what they did to young boys and girls. And that's why he fought them to, to the death. Uh, and that's Vlad the Impaler. You know. So... Imagine 400 years of all this. There will be atrocities. Yes, there they were, they were slaughters. And uh, what actually, what they're reversing right now with the Battle of Navarino, uh, without the reason that the great powers intervened, they didn't want to intervene at all. They wanted Greece not to have independence. And if they couldn't stop them, because also a lot of people from those countries were actually pushing the governments, but America openly couldn't, uh, you know, Britain could not. Uh, Germany, uh, Austria, uh, Austria-Hungary, they were not going to do that because if Austria-Hungary uh, helped Greece, then they have all the Serbs and, and Croatians and other Slavs that were in their empire. That causes later the World War I. Uh, the, the, the Russians helped uh, more discreetly, but they couldn't openly support it either. Uh, so nobody wanted the Greeks to have independence. And the only reason they really helped them with the Battle of Navarino is because uh, Ibrahim Pasha, the Sultan of uh, the Albanian Sultan of, of Egypt, under the direction of the of uh, the Sultan of Constantinople, asked for his help, 
and with an Arab fleet to come and destroy the Greek revolutionaries in the Peloponnese and, now, and to settle there. Okay, so these are, these are non-ethnic Europeans that were going to come, settle into Crete and the Peloponnese to crush the revolution. And that kind of signaled the alarm bell in Europe. You can't have this. You have to stop. You know, there, there is a status quo. You stay where you are and you stay where you are. Now you've broken that line and the Turks are going to have to pay. And they destroyed your fleet. That's what happened. And then they gave us a Germanic king, <laughs> you know. So this is only like recent, though, that you've been hearing this fan the last 10 years that, they, you know, uh, I, I collect magazines. Uh, I, I keep abreast of history stuff internationally. And now the Ottoman history and, and the modern Turkish history in the, in the magazines. And this is stuff from the History Channel, from actually from Australia, too, from America, uh, publications that say, uh, Bubulina was like, you know, Albanian, uh, that uh, Polupatroni was uh, there were locks, they were this, that the, the Turks were actually better than the Byzantines, that they actually tolerated all the nations. Uh, and the Byzantines, you know, the people before them were actually cruel and tyrannical, and they, and they helped liberate, you know, the Greek Christians, and they were actually were better for them. This is what they're pushing. So obviously they're going to push the next step is, you know, the Greeks, when they rebelled, they caused massacres on the Muslim populations. You know, forget about the genocide that happened for 30 years between 1893 to, you know, 1922 of all the Christian minorities in the Ottoman Empire, Greeks, Armenians, Assyrians, that stuff is overlooked. But, you know, we're talking about the Greek Revolution and Kolkotroni, whose family lost 77 people, brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles. And that just, and uh, the other question you had is that most of the Greek revolutionaries basically died poor <laughs> and they were all jailed. Because um, there were different factions of, uh, of people believing on how to rule Greece. Uh, there was an elite. There was the cleftest in Anatoly, which were the mountain people, like the, the warriors, right, from the mountains. They didn't want to have uh, Athens or whatever, in Nafio, to be the central governing power. They wanted to just be there on their own. Uh, and then you had other, like the Fanayotas, that wanted to create the Byzantine Empire again, with many different peoples in it. So, yes, there were, there were different ideologies, and that will all get sort of, it, it takes 100 years by the time all that stuff is hashed out. So the history doesn't start there, it doesn't, you know, end there, it continues on. You know, this was just the spark of the revolution. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for that question. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brother Billy, we have another question. It says, what, what was the population of Greece in 1821? Um, you know, I think one of the early slides says it. Um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head. It was in one of the slides, I believe. But it's, uh, I mean, you're, you're talking like all of all of it, like 3 million, something like that, you know, uh, I will say off the top of my head. Because the rest were outside of Greece. So Macedonia, which was the, the, the yearning of, the, of Greece, was basically to retake Macedonia and northern Greece and Thrace. That's what's important. And a lot of the revisionists modern history is, is in those areas too because they want you know the pipelines have to go through somewhere and they go through this part of greece uh to go into europe right so uh mm. those are the, the the places they need to destabilize you know, kosovo northern greece you know so mm. unfortunately more of, of the greeks were there in asia minor so after the um catastrophe of asia minor in 1922 and the population exchanges uh we we got like another million or and a half Greeks from those places. So hmm. figure now we're about 10 million and we doubled, you know, it was about three and a half million. That was the population of probably the Greek state at the time. Okay. Uh, one question before that, who would you say is the single most important ally of the Greek freedom fighters? Of, uh, of the ally? It was the Philhellenes. Uh, it was definitely people like Lord Byron, uh, um howie he was an american uh um uh activist historian uh there, there were um shelley you know keats there were uh, and napoleon originally wanted to also do away with the ottoman empire and destroy it and to liberate the balkans you know he was kind of like in the beginning as well um some of the czars catherine the great uh, actually i didn't have time to start with the story I, I, I don't have the, I, f I forgot it. I have the little kids running around. <laughs> the detail, the Greek, the, one of the earlier Greek revolutionaries 
which the name escapes me now. I can answer it you know, later. You can find me on Facebook or the Hellenic History Series page. Um, he's the one that actually goes to, uh, to Captain the Great. And uh, he, was a, he was a pirate and uh, actually a, a proto-revolutionary and then becomes a benefactor of the Greek state who uh, starts to deal with uh, the caviar business in the Black Sea. You know, it was a Greek that started that in Russia. And Catherine the Great was a, a Philhellene. She helped him, and she helped a lot of other Greek revolutionaries as well. So she's another one and some of the czars. And, uh, but definitely, uh, you know, people like Lord Byron, he gave his life for the cause, and he was very, very famous. Uh, okay. Excellent. Uh, one he would be that ideal. Yeah. Great. Professor? Uh, there's one more. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I just typed the question, but I don't know if you had a chance to read it. Uh, either way, it's very short. Uh, your earliest slide show a, a flag with a, a white flag with a blue cross, the opposite of what is today. My understanding was that the blue and white, used even today by Greece, came from the Bavarian dynasty that you alluded to. However, your slide showed that that is that actually correct, that those colors were from long before. Would you like to, or can you explain a little bit the origins of those colors? Are Christian related, Marian colors are they called? Thank you very much, I enjoy uh, it. What, what's your name, because um, you cut off, what's uh, your name? Gus, Gus, Gustavos. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gus. Um, you know, if you look at the, the heraldry books, uh, I do have one. Uh, the heraldry is the, the banners and the flags of the European monarchies. Uh, there is a Bavarian one that is the, you know, the blue and white cross. Um, but then again, it's also part of the Greek revolutionaries from before as well. And, and the cross is the cross, you know, that, that goes back to St. Constantine the Great and the lava on there. Um, so... Uh, that's that's a. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. I would say definitely there's a there's a Bavarian element, uh, but it's also part of the early Greek revolutionaries too in, the, in their in their regions as well. So you know, again, where did the the Hungarians have the double-headed eagle, right, uh, as their emblem? And the Germans have a lot of things that are Greek that comes from Byzantium. So you know, in in, in the end, it goes back to Byzantium as well. So it doesn't matter where it's from. Uh, but a lot of the modern European states do have the cross in a, in a blue and white kind of a, a, a color uh, scheme. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of both. I'm not going to say 100%. Uh, I'm not sure on that. Okay. Excellent. Uh, we have Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have another that says, what is written in English about the youngest of the three founders of the Filikia Eteria? Athanasius uh, Tsakalov. What is written in English? Yeah. Uh, if there is a book, you mean? Uh, uh, if I there's a book, uh, I will recommend uh, Richard Clark, A Concise History of Modern Greece. You'll find information uh, in that. Um, and then there's uh, the, the big books uh, from Greek history, but that's in Greek. But in English, it will be, uh, you know, Richard Clark is a good one. Um, Harry Mark Petrakis, who writes historical novels, he just passed away. He, he has uh, some books on the Greek Revolution, um, you know, that part of Greek history and the modern Greek, uh, modern Greek history as well. But uh, I recommend Richard Plogg. Richard, C L O G G, the con a concise history of modern Greece. You'll find uh, what, what you want about the Greek War of Independence in there. Excellent. Excellent. Um, do we have any more questions for Billy? Okay, if we don't have any more questions, um, and could, if- uh, Could I try one more question? Sorry about my late time of again. Of course, of course. Um, I, I liked your comments about Greek Byzantium. And of course, we are very proud of um, the Hellenic part of our traditions. But, and of course in Byzantium, the main language was Greek, which was the world language, and the religion was orthodoxy. But as you say, it was very multicultural. But we do know that for maybe a thousand years, the church was not very interested in Hellenism. 
And I'll give you a quote from Scholarius, the last patriarch of Byzantium. He says, I do not call myself a Hellene because I do not believe as the Hellenes believed. I might call myself a Byzantine because I was born at Byzantium, but I prefer to simply call myself a Christian. Now, your comment about Greek Byzantium, do you think that's sort of a little bit one-sided or pushing our perspective that we like to be connected to Hellenism? Because that doesn't seem to be the approach of the church for over a thousand years there. I got many lectures on this topic. Uh, you can check out Introduction to Byzantium that we've done with Ahepa. I have... Uh, uh, Byzantium's Macedonian history. Uh, that's actually the Macedonian dynasty of uh, Byzantium. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Byzantium is my, you know, one of my, my major topics and themes. And as I mentioned earlier from the beginning of the lecture, with Alexander the Great in the Hellenistic Age and with Constantine the Great continued, you know, we, we wouldn't exist. So that's the Greco-Roman tradition fusing with Christianity. You know, we, we that's where we come from. You can find scholars in a from the late 13, uh, 40s, like, uh, you know, the values was and the nitpick stuff that they said, you know, there, there were people that, you know, trained in, uh, and studied in, uh, in, in France or Germany, uh, the, the, you know, the empires, the, the Ottonian dynasties and stuff like that back then, you know, they were influenced by other thinking. And, uh, if you're going to quote from them, uh, you got, you have to understand the Germans, uh, you know, eventually kind of rewrote history and, uh, and that's the reason we had a German king, you know, kingdom and stuff. And they, and they, and they put spin on things. Uh, what I'm doing actually in, in this new doc, three part documentary about the great war, World War One, uh, I explained the reasons actually that you're talking about this, how this feud happens from the, with the Germans uh, and the British and the French with, with the Greeks and Serbians. And that led to, to the great war that begins in the middle ages, you know, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, uh, we have our own, our own civilization, which is Byzantium, and it was Orthodox Christian. There is no denying that you can find one or two scholars that you know were neo Hellenists that didn't believe in that, and that's fine. And then you can have Anna Komnene, who was the greatest historian of her time, the, the daughter of, of uh, Alexius Komnenos, that wrote the Alexia, uh, and she wrote, you know, we are Rome. That's another another theme that we have to understand. The, the Romans, the Roman Empire was split into two: the Greek East. And the Latin East, you know. So we are the Greek East. It doesn't mean we're, you know, Italian. You know, it means we we have that tradition as well, and so do the Latins. They just don't have a monopoly in that. Yeah. So to be a, a Roman or a Romeo is the same as being a Hellene. It's just in different periods of time, and this is a long period of time. You know, ethnicity uh, and religion kind of like doesn't mean the same thing. You know, back then in Byzantium, you were a Christian. That's what mattered. You were an Orthodox Christian, nothing else mattered. Your, your race was secondary. Uh, again, though, the ruling elite was Greek. Doesn't mean it was just Greek speaking. And it guided, you know, it guided the course of events. So it's, it's, it's a complex issue, but it's also very easy to understand. It's a multicultural, you know, entity that was Greek. Uh, doesn't mean it was, there was no Armenians, there were no Slavs, people were not this. I mean, the last number of of Constantinople, Constantine the Eleventh, was actually half Greek, Serbian, and Italian. You know, but he's a hundred percent Greek because that, that was his culture. You know, the the woman that raised uh, Mehmed the Second, Mara Brankovic, she was Greek, Serbian, Italian. You know, she was a stepmother. So that that's what a Byzantine is, kind of like the, you know this term Byzantine. It's it's you're a Christian. So and and you have a Greco-Roman tradition. So you know these these are like modern ideologies that are like kind of trying to distort the, the historical truth you know that that's what that's what the greeks believed that's the Megali vea that meant to recreate byzantium and that was the driving goal of the greek world independence you know whatever whatever is taught now is different this is like 200 years later so if that answer your question yeah. thank Just you check out the lectures the macedonian dynasty of uh byzantium and uh and uh uh, Byzantium for beginners, I think it's called, or you know, brief history of Byzantium. That explains a lot of the stuff. You know, Brother continue. Billy, we have to continue. Yes, Brother Billy. To be clear, as far as uh, referencing your lectures, we can find them at patreon.com forward slash Hellenic History Series. Yes, that's the best place for those. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and I believe 
Brother Peter, there may have been some additional questions in the chat. Okay, let me scroll up and see if I can find one second. A recent one just came down. Okay. If you want, I can read it. Yeah, read that one if you can. Sure. Okay, we have a question here, Brother Billy. I've heard some claims from even Orthodox Christians about how Greeks are too confident in their conviction. The Byzantines should have won against the Ottomans since presumably the last armies were hijacked by Venetians who were servants of capital, not Christ, and how a lot of the last patriots were pagan. Does this have any merit at all? Uh, does it have any merit at all? Um, that's an opinion. Uh, that's, that's a very, you know, complicated thing to discuss. Let me just, let me just see again. What, what is it? Hold on. Let me just, <laughs> I heard some claims. I guess you got to miss. Ah, okay. I think it's probably um, referring to some of the Greeks that would want to be <clears throat> uh, under the Muslim turban, or versus the because of the Crusades, the, the you know the Catholic, uh, the Catholics or something. Um, to have won against the Ottomans, it was very hard. Uh, there was the the, the ultimate uh, actually goal was. I assume you're talking about 1453, uh, the fall of Constantinople. Kanthi Badalogos had two other brothers that ruled uh, the Peloponnese, uh, Theodore, uh, another brother, and their reinforcements did not make it in time uh, to to save uh, uh, to save Constantinople during the siege uh, because there was turbulent winds and stuff. They were delayed by a month. That that kind of like delayed them, and you know the, the city fell. Uh, ultimately, when Anna Notaras uh, left, and that's in my other on Patreon.com, the lecture of the Battle of Varna, uh, we discussed is when she established a community in Venice with all the other aristocrats and uh, princes from Constantinople and, and the library and, and the church, <laughs> that's kind of like what starts the Renaissance. That's that's a historical fact. Uh, with the Order of the Dragon, the secret society of Christian Balkan Knights with Hungary and Serbia that uh, formed to, and Romania to liberate and protect Christianity and liberate Constantinople. These are things that we're not taught anymore, but uh, they're very important. And they had a plan to temporarily leave Constantinople and eventually get back. All right. So they never like thought that, you know, they couldn't. I mean, realistically, they didn't have the arms and the money to fight, but they were going to have another crusade. And that becomes the crusade of Constantinople after the Battle of Varna, which is with Vladimir Taylor in 1459, four years, five years after the fall. But then there's another empire of Trabizond, the smaller kingdom, that's Pondos, that falls in 1461. And there's other Greek kingdoms and other Balkan kingdoms that eventually fall. So, you know, it was a dark age, just to, to put it in a better descriptive, uh, uh, describe a little bit better for you. You know, to those people, the Christians of the Balkans and Eastern Europe, it was the end of the world. I mean, they, you know, the Ottomans were a lot. And they had armies, and they had multiplied, and they conquered so many other nations that they were, you know, coming into the Balkans. And all they can do is stall for time, because they ruled for 1,100 years. You know, they kind of knew that time would pass. But there was hope that eventually there would be a, a crusade. And uh, I'll I'll leave you with this, if there's nothing else. The niece of Constantine Paleologos, uh, Zoe Paleologina, who becomes Sofia Paleologina. Uh, is in Venice, that's uh, about 30 years later, right? And, and her brothers and siblings. And um, Cardinal Bessarion, he was the Greek, uh, a Greek patriarch that becomes a, a cardinal, you know, Catholic. He's he's raising them and helping them out in Venice. Uh, and the Pope at the time uh, decides that it's a, it's a good idea to match make uh, Sophia, Zoya at the time, with uh, Ivan the third of Russia, the Tsar of Russia, uh, in, in order to bring... You know, the, you have a Byz the, the last Byzantine princes to bring the, the Russians into their sway under the Catholics and, and the Greeks to, to kind of stop them from reimagining that they will be, form the Byzantine Empire again. And Sophia marries Ivan III, but her goal was to, she, she got rid of uh, anything that was Catholic, she became Orthodox again, and they had Ivan IV. You know, she, she reforms Byzantium and Russia, you know, their union, uh, they had Ivan IV. And that's how we have the story of the third month. Uh, Moscow becomes the third Rome. So the novel was the, the new Rome and yeah, the old Rome. 
So the Greeks always had the idea that they're going to come back in some way or another. And Sofia Palolina, once she goes to Russia, uh, helps reinforce the Russians with, with Byzantium and that identity. And that's why we always have that idea that the Russians will always help. Uh, what we tend to forget is there's two dynasties of Russia. It's the Rurik dynasty, which is the Byzantine one that starts with La Basil II, which my rock opera deals with, and Sofia Palolina. Uh, with Mary's died in the third, but that ends in the 1500s. And it comes the Romanov dynasty, which is a different, you know, beast that looks to the West because there's no longer a Greece. So, you know, the, these are the different point of views and whoever tries to choose things and, and nitpick, you know, uh, nitpick, you know, you have a lot because history is always changing. And, uh, you know, but the thing is, there's a constant. The Greeks were there. They never went away. And they dreamt of coming back. Now, with what ruler, who's going to help them, or whatever have you, you know, that's that was a story that kept on unfolding for many centuries. And it still hasn't finished. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, I don't think, I think we got all the questions. I don't see one that I might have missed. I'm looking it over. I think we got all the questions. Hey, unless... Oh, yes, Billy... the last one is about the German. Okay. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, Mr. Kivoditis has one more question. Yes. Um, feel free to ask it. You're also, if you want to unmute and ask it and speak it, that's fine, all right, as well. Is my mic working? Yes. Yes. We hear yes. You. Okay, so you mentioned before about how the Greeks, like how we were forced to have a German monarch onto us, right? Yes. Uh, may, could this be because of how European intellectual circles started taking a Nordicist approach to history of that the ancient Greeks were actually Germanic and that the modern Greeks are just Arabic and Turkic and so they wanted to have like a German king to kind of like enforce that upon the Greeks and this also played into like the into the Enlightenment and the Romanticist era in Germany we had a lot of like philosophers like Nietzsche who praised ancient Greece despite him not being Greek uh uh, Mr. Kivotidis, yes, that actually is a very, very good uh, point. Uh, and uh, the the Philhellenic movement was, uh, you know, varied to the Western Europeans and the Germans and the French. Uh, it did, and in, in the, in the British, uh, it, it did lean towards ancient Greece and the glories of ancient Greece because uh, uh, at that time, in the, after 1812, uh the people from those lands were actually able to travel again into the Ottoman uh, Empire, which was, you know, all Byzantium and ancient Greece and, and the Balkans and Asia Minor, uh, pilgrim, uh, make pilgrimages to the to Jerusalem uh, and, uh, and, and Alexandria. So they were able to revisit places that haven't been able to go for centuries. And obviously what inspired them was seeing the ancient columns. And, and, and if you knew the history, which they, they had learned, you know, they they favored this idea of like, yes, these people are the hires of ancient Greece. And, you know, we were like them too. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That actually was, was part of that, you know, to the Russians, it was more about the religion aspect to the Germans and the French, it would be about ancient Greece. And that's kind of a, a lot of Greeks and took advantage of both sides. And that kind of forms uh, foreign policy up until now, you know, it divides Greece. It's like, you know, do we focus on the ancient Greece? Do we focus on Byzantium, which, the focus was on Byzantium up until 1920, up until like World War II, basically. But after 1922, kind of fades out because we lose those lands uh, with a great catastrophe and, and the genocide. So it was to recreate a Byzantine Empire, but the Europeans wanted us to just uh, focus on ancient Greece and center it on, on Athens and Central Greece. Nothing, uh, nothing more than that, because they wanted to control not the people, you know, obviously the idealists and the, the poets and the writers. Uh, but the governments and the kings wanted control of the uh, Straits of the Bosporus, where Constantinople was. You know, it's um, it's it, it was very important to control the Straits of Bosporus. And if the Ottoman Empire crumbled, they didn't want Greece to get that and to reform another empire. Uh, that's kind of like where where, it's, where, it, where where it does stand. So that's why we have this this infatuation with ancient Greece. And, uh, you know, it helped spur the, the Philhellenic movement as well. But they knew the people were Christians, though. Uh, it just the there's a, there was also another ideological movement that uh, I'm sure many of you know from the 1800s with historians, and this goes back to the Macedonian dynasty of Greece, which I, I, I tackle, that will lead and finally uh, 
end with the, with World War One, um, that the Greeks were the Roman Empire of the East, but so were you know, and then you have the Holy Roman Empire, which was Charlemagne and Otto and all that stuff, and they were the higher. So there, there was also this antagonism. It's like let's not talk about Byzantium too much. We'll concentrate on ancient Greece and focus on that because we don't want those people to recreate that empire again. That was that was the that was very important, and that's what causes Serbia and Greece to constantly have to battle because they they are part of that landmass that the Germans and the French and the British want to get a, a direct route into the Middle East for the oil fields later on. So oil plays a lot of a lot of into what happens in the Caucasus in the Middle East, and unfortunately. A lot of how the public and the media will uh, focus on how to portray Greece, you know. So they give him the king that's Germanic, and he happens to be very good for Greece. And then they give him the Danish. Uh, we get the Danish branch of the Germanic uh, kings, the monarchs, who, who are like, uh, you know, more humble, and they don't do much. And they will always push back, and they will not go against the uh, Germanic British uh, monarchy. Uh, they wanted puppets. Um, so if that answers your question, yes, but it was, it was good that they did have a love for ancient Greece while others had a love for Byzantium, you know, right. but it was because of the tourism, tourism trade that opened up in archaeology, uh, that opened up and a lot of archaeologists, painters and poets were able to go back to those, to those you know, the ancient lands of Greece, uh, and, and do the, uh, the tours, they were called tours, you know, they were, it's a, it was a little bit safer after the 1812, 1820s to go travel uh, and uh, see those places, you know, Marathon, you know, Athens, Nakhon, uh, Olympia, Jerusalem, uh, Alexandria, you know, the places of the Bible in Asia Minor, you know, there were, there were grand tours that they would go on, they would paint, they would, they would take notes and uh, they will bring it back to Europe and you know that's kind of what some of them will focus on the ancient stuff okay um, I think we have one more uh, so the economic cycles of travail at the mercy of the western powers are the underlining theme of the story of modern Greece can you please comment on the basis of why these troubles have repeatedly occurred and whether they might be avoided in the future. I read the beginning again. I'm sorry. Economic cycles of travail at the mercy of the Western powers are the underlining theme of the story of modern Greece. Well, modern Greece went into debt a lot of times. Um, again, even with the revolutions, you know, they, they would loan money out, uh, and that's another way they they were able to maintain the monarchs. Uh, the, the reason the monarchy was established uh, in Greece, Serbia, and uh, you know, eventually Romania, and Bulgaria, Montenegro, um, you know, Italy, <laughs> so, and like all, all those places, the and Ethiopia, you had monarchies that had two, you know ties with with the Germanic monarchy, and they will they will give loans out right for, eventually to for the Ottoman uh, wars, and then. They kind of knew that those people would not be able to repay those loans. And so they secured the islands and other things and privileges. And they did not want to let go. Greece was very important because of, of they had a lot of islands. They were able to control the pirate piracy of the Mediterranean, uh, which was pretty rampant at that time as the Ottomans were kind of crumbling. And um, they wanted to control the pirates. They wanted to control the monarchy uh, as it was. And with loans, you had debt, then you had a lot of civil wars, you had constant government shuffles uh, and people that, that had, uh, you know, it, it was it was one way. I mean, Greece had a lot of debt and uh, it, it didn't really get out of it until, you know, it, it took a long time for it to get uh, out of the revolutionary debt. You know, that, that took a long while. Yeah. But uh, that's why they had to actually, for their interest, they had to maintain the monarchy as well. That was another another reason. Um, yeah. Excellent. I guess that's it. Yeah. Okay, Brother Billy, unless you have any last remarks, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you here this evening. We really, really appreciate it. Um, give you a little hand of applause myself via Zoom. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Thank Stay you. Stay safe and have a wonderful evening.
Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you to our uh, Ahepa Hermes 186 Astoria chapter. If you're in a, in a story in New York, uh, come and see us, please. We do a lot of interesting things, cultural arts, uh, networking, uh, and uh, you know, please support uh, support what we do at Patreon.com Hellenic History Series. For just a dollar a month, you get exclusive perks, you know, stuff behind the scenes, you know, gifts, uh, or donate uh, tax deductible donation to the Porfirio Foundation. You know, everything is on the on the, the website. Um, subscribe to Hellenic History Series on YouTube. That's free. Please like our videos and you know follow us also on Facebook. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll celebrate in our own ways 1821. Everyone stay safe. Stay, stay safe, safe, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.